Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Common Sense with Dr. Ben Carson. And today we have a guest that needs no introduction, uh, the fabulous former Speaker of the House, uh, Newt Gingrich, uh, one of the intellects of our time, a historian, and just a great American. And we have a lot of things to discuss, but he has a new book out called March to the Majority. The Real Story of the Republican Revolution. Mr. Speaker, why is this book important at this time in our history? Well, thank you, Ben. And listen, it's great to be with you. It's always an honor. And uh, when you give me that kind of nice introduction, I feel really good about being allowed <laughs> to be with you. Um, uh, the uh, I wrote March to the Majority with Joe Gaylord, who was my partner in a 16-year project to grow the first Republican majority in 40 years, and then four years of successfully negotiating with President Bill Clinton to get welfare reform, tax cuts, the uh, only four balanced budgets in your lifetime. And March the Majority is a playbook. It's not just about history, but it says basically for the American people, if you want to get back to a balanced budget, if you want to really get the economy growing dramatically, if you want to mop up inflation, here are the things we did that work. And it draw, both draws on my experience working with Ronald Reagan and the work we did while I was Speaker of the House. And I think it's a very useful guide for people who want to learn how can you get things done in the very complex American system and how can you pull together a majority of the American people to win very large bipartisan reforms that we absolutely have to have if we're gonna be successful. So I think March the Majority is really a book that's particularly important for 2024 and 2025 and how we both win and then how we translate that victory into a successful uh, and a very important period of reform to get America back on track again. Yes, now we're in a, kind of a peculiar position in our history right now. You know, previously, there was a lot of dissension and discussion, but everybody kind of wanted the same things. Uh, I'm not sure the Democrats and Republicans want the same things anymore. Uh, in an environment like that, uh, what what can we do? or Or are we going in two different directions, or is it just a perception and are we still on the same page? Well, sadly, I think it's much more than a perception. I think that the left wing of the Democratic Party, which now really defines the modern Democratic Party, <clears throat> is committed to a very different American future. I know in the work you've done at Cornerstone, for example, where you have been teaching young people about actual facts of American history, who was Abraham Lincoln? Why does he matter? Uh, what do we need to learn about the Constitution? Why is it so important, not just to us, but to the whole world as a statement of the rule of law and the rights of individuals? Uh, these kind of things, frankly, we have a totalitarian left that not only doesn't believe in them, but they want to use the power of government to coerce you and me so that we have to say things we don't believe or be in some way censored or canceled, fired from our job, you name it, ridiculed in public. Uh, and it's really a very sobering time. <clears throat> and the gap between most Americans uh, and the totalitarian left is astonishing. I, I run a project called America's New Majority Project, which people can see. In that project, which you can see at americasnewmajorityproject.com, we get huge majorities. For example, uh, on a topic that's very dear to your heart, 84% of the American people believe that parents have the right to know what is happening in their, in their child's class. 84%. Yet the totalitarian left uh, has the FBI investigating parents as potential terrorists, uh, uses the power of government to... Uh, oppose efforts by parents to find out what's going on in the classroom. And there's really a tiny coalition of teachers, union leaders, and left-wing intellectuals uh, and bureaucrats that are determined to change America, even though 
84% of the American people, that's more than four out of every five, believe that parents ought to be at the center of their child learning, not some bureaucracy. So that's an example of what we're up against. And uh, I have to say, you are one of the great courageous leaders who is intellectually helping lead the effort uh, to restore American values and an understanding of American history. And as a historian, I really appreciate what you're doing. Well, thank you. The, the midterm elections turned out very differently than people thought that they were going to turn out. What's your take on, on that? What happened? Was it the I think, abortion? Well, I think abortion was a piece of it, but I think there were two big things. One was that in some key Senate races, the Democrats just raised massively more money. Uh, we had races where we were being outspent in October by 10 to 1. We also failed to understand the importance of early voting. So we had, for example, in Pennsylvania, 60% of the people had voted before Republican ads went up. Uh, one of the things I'm watching with great interest is Governor Glenn Youngkin in Virginia, who has off-year legislative elections this year. He's launched a real project to get Republicans to vote early. And it'll be yeah. interesting to see. And I think he's so popular right now in Virginia. He has a real chance of picking up a lot of legislative seats and maybe being a model for Republicans for next year. The other thing that we failed at is we failed to offer enough positive ideas. Uh, we lost, for this was only the second time in 19 off-year elections that the party in the White House actually carried independence. Uh, very narrow by two points. But historically, we should have been ahead by nine or 10 points among independents. And the reason I think, and here I'm deeply influenced uh, by Dave Winston of the Winston Group, uh, I think the reason is uh, we did not offer positives, even though Kevin McCarthy had developed a commitment to America. We didn't identify it clearly. We didn't advertise it. And so people went into the voting booth saying, yeah, I'm kind of mad about the Democrats, but what are the Republicans going to do? And I think that cut probably 20 or 30 seats off of what we could have gained in the Senate. We have to solve the money problem and we have to solve the early voting problem. Uh, I think if we do that, 2024 could be a great year because I think that Biden continues to decay. I think the Democrats have no way to get away from Biden and Kamala Harris. And I think that that's a ticket that could be like Jimmy Carter and leading ultimately to a catastrophic repudiation. Well, there, there are a few countries in the world that have a voting system like ours. Uh, you, you go back to 1975. France outlawed mail-in voting, except in very specific cases, because they said it was too ripe for cheating. They said there's just no way to control it. Why is it that we continue to use a system that allows so much manipulation? Is it because we want to manipulate it? What, what's the reason for that? Well, look, I think the Democrats have understood all along that unless they can stuff the ballot box, they're probably not going to win. And so in big city machines, places like Philadelphia, Chicago, New York, uh, Los Angeles, they work overtime uh, to make sure that they can get votes that are very doubtful. Um, I think the Democrats realize that if we went to a, sort of a French model and had everybody vote on one day, had everybody have to have a uh, an ID to prove who they were, and were very tough about uh, people cheating, uh, that probably the Democrats would lose almost every election. And I think they know that. And I think that's why you've seen this very long 30 or 40 year project to maximize how easy it is to steal. You know, when you have, for example, the service employees union, um, organize a nursing home, and then you have uh, left-wing Democrats in the Service Employees Union actually helping uh, 80, 90-year-old people vote who may no longer be fully cognitively there, uh, you know that they're going to overwhelmingly vote Democrat. And that's an example of the kind of challenge that we're up against. I think the other thing is um, that we have to recognize, and I think this year with uh, the 
Operation Bank Your Vote at the Republican National Committee that uh, Ronna McDaniel, the National Committee chairwoman, has really undertaken a project to maximize the number of poll watchers, to maximize Republican early voting, and to see if we can't sort of match the Democrats uh, in uh, dealing directly with ballots under the rules that currently exist. In the long run, we'd be much better off to have one day voting with a with an identity, with a facial identity, uh, and have pretty strict rules about absentee balloting. And you'll find in those kind of settings that Republicans do dramatically better because it's much harder for Democrats to manufacture votes in that kind of setting. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And Obviously, if it was a situation that we wanted to alleviate, we could do it. <laughs> we could put a man on the moon. We can do all kinds of things if we really want to. <laughs> so it tells you something. That's right. right. Now, you know, last night on the way from the airport, I was talking to the driver who was obviously very left-leaning. And he knew nothing about so many of the issues that are actually going on and was making outrageous claims about who the Republicans were, completely non-factually based. You know, I disabused him of many of his, uh, he, he didn't know who I was, by the way. Uh, so he just assumed since I was black that I was a liberal. And so, so I got a lot of information out of him. <laughs> it was quite interesting. But, you know, how do we get people informed when you have such a biased media out there? Well, that's why I think podcasts like this one are really important. I think uh, talk radio is really important. I think uh, being effective at using social media is really important. I mean, the objective reality is that most of the traditional elite media is actually uh, totally involved uh, with the uh, kind of people who it's not that they're not neutral. They are the active allies of the Democrats. They actively protect Biden. They actively distort information about Republicans. They hide from issues that will hurt Democrats. And they try to maximize ways of hurting Republicans. That's just a fact. And by the way, it's not a new fact. Uh, Theodore White uh, devoted an entire chapter in the making of the president in 1968 to how the news media had evolved and how liberal it had become, and how hostile to Republicans it was. You know, that's 1968, uh, some almost 60 years ago, uh, White was already writing about the way the liberal media was sliding into becoming the uh, basically uh, the, the captive media of the left. Right, the new arm of the left. Now, we're going to uh, take a break in a minute, but before we do, I want to ask you one quick question. Uh, we've had some real questions about the cognitive function of our current president, of the majority leader on the Republican side in the Senate, uh, of some of the senators uh, from California who are quite elderly. Do you think it would be a reasonable thing uh, to require people to have cognitive function tests that are publicly revealed after they reach a certain age? Well, I think certainly if there are significant questions about their functioning, uh, that they have a public interest, a duty, if you will, to the American people to uh, go through this. I'm, I've been told and, and I mean, you're a, you're a great doctor. Uh, and uh, since my doctorate's in history, I know nothing about this. Uh, but uh, I'm told, for example, in the case of McConnell, that it's probable that with the right medicine uh, and, and a little bit more rest, that he, in fact, uh, should be able to recover. He was He's suffering from a concussion, which is different than cognitive decline, but has an effect which is comparable to cognitive decline. But I'm, I'm told by people, neurologists who admit they haven't personally examined him, that normally when you have these kind of moments, that can actually be controlled by medicine. We'll see. I think in the case of Senator Feinstein, it's very clear uh, that she she's now at a point where actually her assistant, who I think is Nancy Pelosi's daughter, uh, is actually voting her vote. 
Uh, she has no idea where she is. She has no idea what she's doing. She's a lovely lady. She was a very good. She was the first woman mayor of San Francisco. I worked with her many times. She she had a natural kind of centrist liberalism that was not radical. And she was very charming and willing to work with people. It's tragic to see how she's being sort of carried forward uh, in a way which uh, I think demeans her, certainly means that the people of California don't have an effective senator. Uh, and in her case, you, you could make a pretty strong argument that the Senate should be able to ask for some kind of cognitive test. In the case of President Biden, my sense is, and again, we're all outsiders. None of us are his medical doctor. But my sense is that he has a classic long-term decline of cognitive capacity, whether that's Alzheimer's or hardening of the arteries or whatever's going on, we don't know. But there's no question, if you look at pictures of him two years ago, uh, or a video of him two years ago, and a video of him in Maui, I mean, the person in Maui didn't know where he was or what he was doing or what he was supposed to do. I mean, it was embarrassing. And I find it doubly embarrassing because um, this is the commander in chief of the most powerful nation in the world. Now, if you're our enemies and you're watching that video, you have to be thinking this guy is potentially vulnerable and we could potentially do things that we couldn't do if he was healthy. And just to prove that, you know, during uh, the Afghanistan uh, evacuation, uh, the generals, the advisors said not to do what he did. And he said, no, no, I'm not paying attention to what you guys want. Get them out of there and get them out of there by this date. Uh, you know, when you have somebody who has that kind of power and that kind of authority, uh, who has access to the nuclear codes, it is a very frightening thing. and. I hope at some point the, the Democrats recognize that we have to put the interests of the country above the interests of parties. You know, Republicans need to recognize that too. We all need to recognize that because America, the American dream, all that we stand for is at risk when we put party politics above national interests. I wanted to ask you about uh, some of the, the big issues that Americans are facing today, like the economy and inflation. Do you think a lot of what we're facing is self-inflicted or are these natural cycles? No, I think on inflation, it's almost entirely self-inflicted. And frankly, the Federal Reserve effort to raise interest rates uh, is very weakened by the Biden administration's determination to spend so much money. I mean, the objective fact is, if the federal government is pouring trillions of dollars into the economy and borrowing in order to do it, uh, you are going to have an inflationary effect from federal spending. And at the same time, if they're adopting regulations that restrict supply, so that, for example, we are not producing as much oil and gas as we could, then that's going to put an upward pressure again because there'll be scarcities. So the combination of regulatory constraint leading to scarcities, which drives up price, government spending, which drives up price, and the underlying uh, wage push now, because now what you're seeing is the unions who have been very strengthened by the Biden administration are asking for bigger and bigger pay raises. Somebody said that the demands of the United Auto Workers, if they were met by the American auto manufacturers, would literally bankrupt them. Uh, you would see Toyota and Mercedes and others just take over the whole market because the UAW plants would be so expensive. So you have a lot of different pressures. These are all avoidable. Um, again, David Winston has developed what he calls a presidential inflation index. And he, he, what he's done is very clever. He starts with the day you're sworn in and measures all price increases while you're president. Well, it turns out that so far, Biden is at about a 16.5 or 17% increase since he became president, about three times the level of increase that Donald Trump had in the same period. Uh, but the only president 
in modern times who has had a bigger increase than in prices than uh, Joe Biden was Jimmy Carter. Uh, well, that ended disastrously. Uh, and you, you know, they can run around all they want to. They thought they were very clever coming up with the term Bidenomics. But Bidenomics now means expensive bread, expensive eggs, uh, expensive gasoline, expensive rent, expensive electricity bills. Uh, and actually, I think Bidenomics is going to turn out to be one of the rocks uh, which, end, which ends the Biden uh, presidency as a one-term presidency. Now, what about uh, Ukraine? You know, I've looked at that situation. I think we all feel for the Ukrainian people. There's no question about that. But we've created a situation with our energy policies where we give Putin almost unlimited money. He can drag this thing out forever while bleeding our economy. What do we do? Well, that's a good example where we should frankly have an American energy independence program to drive down the price both for the American people, but for the Europeans, and to reduce the amount of money that Russia can get. I mean, it's kind of crazy for us to, in effect, be facilitating the Russians getting more money for their oil and gas, uh, while at the same time we're trying to help Ukraine defeat them on the battlefield. And I think that it's very important that we recognize, I think it's very important that Russia not be allowed to win. I think it would be a dramatically more dangerous world if the Russians do win. But at the same time, I think we have to recognize that the uh, the American policies at times by the, by the Biden administration actually strengthens Russia by raising the price of oil on the world stage, and which raises the amount of money that Putin has to wage war. Exactly. Now, I, it, it would require somebody, again, who has the ability to sit down and deal with the facts and make policies based on the facts and on our desires. You know, the, this whole thing about energy, I was talking to someone uh, earlier this week on the other side. So we got to get rid of all the fossil fuels. Uh, what a crazy idea. Why not use what you have to get what you want? You know, we, we want to get to a place where we have renewable, uh, clean energy. But you're not going to get that by shutting off the mechanism that will allow you to get there. And, and, and that's the problem with ideology. Uh, it, it kind of excludes logic and common sense. You know, if we could ship uh, American natural gas to China and replace all of the Chinese coal-burning electric plants with natural gas plants, that would do more to lower the amount of carbon being put in the atmosphere than any other single act. Because it doesn't matter what we do. You can't fix the American economy deeply enough on carbon to offset the scale of Chinese and Indian uh, coal-burning plants. that They add new plants every week. And here we are. We cripple ourselves. We weaken our economy. We unemploy Americans. We raise the price for Americans. It has no effect worldwide. Uh, makes may, makes the left wingers feel virtuous, but the fact is, until you find a way to wean India and China off of coal and onto something like natural gas or onto a modern nuclear power, unless you do those things, you have no long term effect on carbon loading in the atmosphere. Absolutely. And then I want to just get your thoughts on on education. You you've been invaluable to us at American Cornerstone, the little patriots. Uh, which is doing very well. Last week I was in Alaska and the superintendent of schools said, Carson cannot come to our public schools, which created such an uproar that we had a much bigger audience than we would have had otherwise. And I think he may wind up losing his job. Everybody, there was no one who was on his side. Well, what, what was his, I'm curious, what was his reasoning? Why did he not he want you to... He was asked for a reason. He couldn't give one. It's obviously because he's a left winger. And uh, because I was part of the Trump administration, uh, he thinks he has to protect the kids from me. Uh, these kinds of thoughts are, are, are awful. But, but then again, 
look at what's happening to our society. There's a dumbing down that's going on. Uh, when right. you look at some of these man on the street interviews and you ask people simple, just the simplest things, and they have no idea what you're talking about. What, but what is the consequences of that to a society? Well, we're not going to be able to compete with China if we graduate students who can't do math, can't read, don't know any history, don't have any problem-solving capabilities. I mean, this is a real crisis. I always tell people the, the education system is the greatest single crisis in the American system because it is going to lead to people who can't get jobs, have no future, end up in an underground economy selling drugs and, and selling prostitution and, and being criminals. Uh, and the net result is a downward spiral, which we're seeing right now in San Francisco as store after store leaves the city because it's too dangerous. There's too much crime uh, and the living conditions have decayed to a point where it's, it's as though there's no longer a civilized city. Um, yeah. So I think what you're doing, and this is why I've been so supportive of Cornerstone, you are creating for teachers and children. A easy to understand, fascinating introduction to all sorts of things about American history and the people of American history. And I find every time I, I review some of this material, it's really well done. Uh, and it's really, really important. I'm, I'm actually working on a project now. I'd be curious to get your reaction. Uh, I'm, I'm beginning to think that we should take all of the Department of Education money, turn it into scholarships for kids. Uh, and if you did that and you eliminated all the various federal red tape requirements, uh, it's estimated that 46% of the administrative cost of a local school system is filling out paperwork for the federal government, 46%. So you could also liberate money locally to pay, pay teachers more and to create local scholarships to match up with the federal scholarship. But I think we I could think create a scholarship yeah. for every child. Uh, and I'd rather have money going to students than going to bureaucrats. Uh, so that, that's one of the projects we're working on. That's the reason, of course, the, the college costs are going up so high also, because you have this administrative state uh, and universities, which is sucking up more than 25% of all the money. Uh, and, you know, that, that brings me to medicine. We spend $13,100 per capita on a citizens every year in medicine. Think about that. Most concierge practices are only five to ten thousand dollars. We spend thirteen thousand one hundred per person. There's got to be a better way to use that. What do you need for good health care? Health care provider and a patient. Along comes the middleman and the system to facilitate the relationship, and then they become the primary entity controlling everything else and sucking out all the money. It makes no sense. And uh you know, if we can ever get to a point where we can take these things out of the political arena and actually deal with them as intelligent people that God gave a brain to, I think we can solve these things pretty quickly, quite quite frankly. But I want to get your your thoughts on the debate, the first uh, Republican <laughs> debate that occurred. <laughs> Look, I, I thought the... I thought they were basically pretty smart people. They had pretty interesting answers. You had some very diverse personalities. Um, I also think that uh, it's pretty clear that Trump is so far ahead that he's probably going to be the nominee. But I thought Governor DeSantis was was more than adequate. People had worried that he, you know, uh, he would underperform. I thought uh, I'm, I'm fascinated with the rise of Vivek Ramaswamy, uh, who at 38 years of age is very smart, uh, has founded two billion dollar companies. Um, you know, and, and again, he, he has never been in politics here. He's clearly got some things that he's going to have to fix, but he was interesting. Uh, I thought Nikki Haley was very aggressive and did a very good job uh, of uh, particularly on national security and foreign policy. But, you know, she was a good reform governor of South Carolina. So I thought those were sort of the three high spots 
of the debate. Uh, and uh, I thought as a Republican, I could be proud of all of them. I thought they were good, solid, intelligent people uh, trying to find. And, and I really liked the fact that the Fox moderators uh, focused on real issues and only spent one segment on Trump and spent all the rest of the time talking about things that really matter to the American people. Well, speaking of Trump, uh, what are your thoughts on the indictments against President Trump? I think the indictments are third world dictatorial behaviors that are totally unconstitutional. Uh, They remind me of the Nicaraguans who just arrested uh, the bishop and just expelled all the Jesuits. Uh, It reminds me of Russia, where Putin's major rival just got sentenced to 19 more years in jail. Um, You know, this is an absurdity. Uh, The person in charge of the federal cases was repudiated unanimously by the Supreme Court in an earlier case for having lied to the jury. Uh, The the judge who is going to hear the case is the daughter of a Jamaican revolutionary who was uh, locked up for years uh, because he was, in fact, uh, genuinely committed to destroying Western civilization. Uh, The district attorney uh, in uh, Fulton County is the daughter of a Black Panther uh, who in his youth was deeply committed to destroying American society. I mean, you look at these things and you think, you know, you couldn't write a novel like this. Right. Uh, and, I, and you can tell that Trump gets stronger with every indictment uh, because people, not so much that they're for Trump, but they're so angry about a system that is this rigged uh, that uh, they don't want to in any way uh, support the system in its persecution of an American political opponent. Yeah, I think the American people are a lot smarter than uh, some people give them credit for. And they realize that if this is allowed to stand, that's pretty much the end of us as a nation, the way we have been formulated. And, you know, our founders kind of foresaw this kind of thing. And that's why they put in the system of checks and balances. But what is the check on the executive branch of government. It's the Justice Department. And if the Justice Department is in bed with them, where is the check? Is there a check? Or do they just do whatever they want to do? Well, that's that's why elections are so important. Ultimately, the American people are the final check on the entire system. You know, our founders were very smart people. They're, some of them might have actually been on a genius level, to be honest with you. And uh, they studied virtually every governmental system that ever existed because they were eclectic and they would take from the, the good stuff and cleanse out the bad stuff. And the reason they were doing it is because they recognize that it doesn't seem to matter how a government starts. They all kind of end up the same way, growing, infiltrating, dominating. And the Constitution was to keep that from happening in our country against all the odds. How are we doing? Well, I mean, first of all, we've had an amazing almost 250-year run. So at one level, you have to say, as an experiment in human freedom, uh, there's nothing like it. Uh, people come from all over the world. Uh, Cliss and I are doing a, a, a TV series right now called Journey to America, where we're interviewing first-generation migrants who legally come to the U.S. and who contribute to America. Uh, people, for example, like Henry Kissinger uh, or Winsome Sears, the lieutenant governor of uh, Virginia. I mean, it's, it's fascinating. And it tells you something. I mean, America is a country people want to come to because they want freedom. They want opportunity. They want a chance for a better life. Now, we are under challenge. I think this is the greatest challenge to our constitutional system since the Civil War. And I think that not for 160 years have we had this greater challenge. And it is a organized, methodical, totalitarian left that wants to use government to impose on the rest of us the values that they believe in, whether we agree with them or not. 
And I think that's a very real and very dangerous challenge. They've infiltrated the universities. They've infiltrated the news media. They've infiltrated some of the judges. Uh, it, it's a, it, many of the bureaucrats. It's, it's going to be a real struggle. On the other hand, the American people increasingly realize that this is wrong, that it would destroy America as we've known it. And you see a bigger and bigger backlash growing across all groups. Every American group now has significant opposition to this kind of left-wing totalitarianism. Yeah, it's interesting to see that, that some of the, uh, the leftist groups that have traditionally been very supportive are starting to migrate away, which is causing them great concern, now particularly you know, the black community. And uh, I find it almost humorous when I see what they're doing in California, you know, offering the, the reparations. Everybody knows there's not going to be any reparations, but you hold that carrot out in front of them and say, yeah, this is what, how many times does that happen before people say, I'm done with you? And a lot of those people are starting to say, I'm done with you now. And I'm very glad to see it. You know, people need to just look at the facts and look at the issues. But more importantly, I think we as Americans need to learn how to talk to each other instead of getting in our respective corner and throwing hand grenades at each other. Because isn't that part of the way that you destroy a society? And I think it's fascinating when you look at the congressional record from January the 10th, 1963, and you see the 45 goals of the communists that were written down, and you see how many of them have been accomplished including things like gaining control of the public schools so you can indoctrinate the kids, getting God out of the society, driving wedges between parents and students. I mean, it is, it is remarkable that 60 years ago uh, all of this was going on. Everybody thinks that this is of recent origin. It's been going on for a long time. You've got to wake up pretty soon or they will accomplish. We think we want the Cold War. But uh, I'm not so sure that uh, Khrushchev wasn't right when he told Eisenhower that his grandchildren's children will live under their system. Yeah, I, I often tell people that Reagan defeated communism in Moscow, but lost to it at Stanford. Yes, absolutely. You know, what are some of the positive messages that you find to be? resonating with Americans. Well, I think when, when you talk to people, first of all, about America, uh, about, um, in, our, in our polling at the America's New Majority Project, about 83% of the country is very proud to be American. Uh, when you talk to people about Reverend Martin Luther King's formula, that he wanted, he had a dream of a country where the content of his children's character would be more important than the color of their skin. By 91 to 7, Americans agree with that. Uh, when you look at the future and you say to yourself, we have the largest reserves of oil and gas in the world. We have enormous mineral potential. We have a continent-wide country. We have one of the two greatest farming areas in the world in Iowa in terms of just the, the soil. We have one of the most productive fruit and vegetable production areas in the world in California. And, and, and in Florida, and you look around, and you realize uh, this is an amazing country. And because yeah. we allow freedom, because we guarantee freedom, people can go out there. I mean, here's Elon Musk from South Africa, raised in part in Canada, now an American, uh, inventing new reusable rockets to get all of us to the moon and Mars, developing new approaches at Tesla for electric cars and trucks, developing new approaches at X, which used to be Twitter, um, having helped develop PayPal. Um, this is the American system. People can really bring genius here, and here it flourishes. Uh, in other places, the bureaucracy, the elites, the government uh, sit on you and limit your ability, but not here. And I think Americans understand deep down that this is a system worth fighting for and worth protecting. Absolutely. I hope people hear that loud and clear and recognize that one of the reasons that we rose so quickly 
is that we allow common sense and market forces to determine where we went rather than a bunch of bureaucrats mandating things. And uh, that's what that's what made us the city on the hill. And we need to get back to that. Well, what would you, as our last piece of advice, tell those private citizens who want to get involved, who want to help, who want to help our nation be all it can be? What would you tell them to do? Well, I, I always tell young people, dream big, work hard, learn every day, and be true to yourself. And I think that also applies to everybody. Um, you know, you you can contribute to America in so many ways. Uh, you can be a brilliant ballerina, a great painter, a great entrepreneur, a good teacher. You can care about your neighbors. Uh, you can volunteer to help those who are desperately in need of help. You can become a policeman or policewoman. I mean, there's so many ways you can be involved. And America is open to everybody who's willing to work hard and learn. And uh, we developed a term when we spent 16 years trying to create a majority. It was frustrating at times. And we yeah. created a term of of, peer, of uh, cheerful persistence. And so I would encourage people, you know, and you must have gone through this because your entire background, the amount you learned, uh, the remarkable world-class abilities you developed as a surgeon, um, that didn't come overnight and it didn't come automatic. And so you know what it's like to persevere. And you also know the great joy of having all your skills come together and something miraculous happens. So I, I tell people, you know, America is a country where, and the Europeans never understand this, we are a country where you get to pick something you really like doing, get paid 40 hours for doing it, and then for the next 40 hours, do it as your hobby. Europeans think you're working hard. You think you're having a lot of fun. That's the American <laughs> way. Well, Mr. Speaker, it's been an absolute joy and a pleasure to have you here. And I want to thank you on behalf of the American people for being the epitome of common sense. And you and your life and what you've contributed has made an enormous difference in our country and the quality of life we all have. And thank you. May God continue to bless you. Thank you. Well, how wonderful it was to have uh, Speaker Newt Gingrich with us to share his wisdom, his uh, tremendous history of knowledge of uh, our country's history. And uh, I would uh, advise you to go out and get his book, March to the Majority. There's so much insight there uh, from his study of people like Ronald Reagan, uh, Bill Clinton, Richard, e. Richard Nixon, all of these uh, political figures have something to contribute. Uh, you don't have to agree with all of them, but you can learn from all of them. The difference between a wise person and a fool is a wise person can learn from other people's mistakes and their triumphs. And a fool has to do everything themselves and suffer the consequences in many cases. I hope we'll be different. And for your prescription, try to become informed. Don't just listen to other people's opinion and parrot them. Listen to lots of opinions, read lots of opinions, read the facts and use the most incredible gift you have, the human brain. That's it for this week. Make sure you join us every week. And please subscribe for free on Apple Podcasts. Make sure you don't miss any of the broadcasts, Stitcher. And make sure you tell other people about us. And uh, we have to make sure that we spread common sense. Because that will help us to recognize that we, the American people, are not each other's enemies. And if we learn how to use our brains and work together, our best days are still ahead of us. Keep up the good work, join us again, and remember the cornerstones, faith, liberty, community, and life. See you next week.